Okay, so we've seen that every single moment getting rescued is God's big, for lack of a better word, because I don't know another word to call it, God's big orgasm. This is what thrills him about each moment. He loves rescuing every moment, baptizing it with some meaning. That's the ultimate victory, okay? Because then it doesn't matter if the outcome is good or bad. It doesn't matter if Satan wins. Because he gets to do what he wants anyway. Practice righteousness in whatever form it is. Totally free. So Satan really is free to win. And it's okay that he's free to win. It's not a compromise of righteousness if Satan wins. This is something the Calvinists don't understand. They think that God has to gerrymander or restrict or constrain in order to win. They have no understanding of sovereignty at all. It's a little crack up. The guys who rightly stress grace and sovereignty are the ones who least understand either one. Okay. It's a normal question to say, well, okay, fine. Every single moment, no matter what happens, is a victory because God really just wants to practice righteousness no matter how the outcome turns out. But wouldn't it be an unrighteous outcome if Satan wins? Isn't that unrighteous? I mean, you know, I'm included in this. Hold on. I'm included in this. I mean, for Satan to win, that would be unjust, wouldn't it? And the point of the previous increment was to explain that even if Satan wins, he loses. Because first of all, he's not going to be happy. I mean, what's the point of being alive if you're not happy? And second, all those things that he's going to do are exactly the same things that he's doing now. And he's not winning now. So if he wins, he doesn't win. So that outcome is not winning. Even if he wins over God, he's not winning. It begs the question of what constitutes a winning outcome. And the point of the last increment was, hi, you win even if you lose. Because what winning means is that you're fulfilled by practicing righteousness. That's the only thing that's fulfilling. But dato yadstik, out of his knowledge he makes righteous, Isaiah 53, 11. That's what fulfilling is. Now, God happens to pronounce, because he feels like it, that that saves. Because to God, it's fulfilling to save. That's his opinion. He's omnipotent. He can do whatever he wants. And that's what he wants to do with it, is save, rescue. He manufactures righteousness. We are baptized with the righteousness of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God just flat pronounces that. It's just flat his omnipotent decision and he makes good on it because he feels like it. That's what he likes. See how practicing righteousness and pronouncing righteousness are two sides of a coin? And see how that outcome of saving us pleases him? And we're certainly pleased by it. I mean, I don't want to go to the lake of fire, do you? But... Salvation doesn't mean that everything's nice and feels good. I mean, how long have you been saved? Probably a while. Do you feel good all the time? No. But you know you're saved all the time, hopefully. If not, you're going to start knowing at some point. You can't die. You can't go to hell. You can't be apart from God whether you want to or not. That's an outcome. That's a result. 
It's an aggregate result of all the years you've lived on this planet, knowing or not knowing the gospel, believing or not believing in the gospel, until at some point in your life, maybe a little bit ago, maybe a long time ago, you finally got straight on what the gospel is and you believe Christ paid for your sins. That's an outcome. What did it take to get you to that point? Maybe you were 20 when it happened to you. Maybe you were 5. Maybe you were 45. But at some point in your life, you finally got straight on what the gospel is and you believed. Maybe you did it many times because you belonged to some apostate church where they have to evangelize you you know, every Sunday instead of actually giving you Bible doctrine. And they consider it holy to have church on Wednesday and Sunday. And, you know, it's a 20-minute speech that the pastor spends all week to prepare, and it's all very shallow because the believers in the church just can't stand much Bible, so that's all he can teach them. Okay, fine, but it got you to some place at some point where you said and you knew how I have to believe Christ paid him for my sins in order to be saved. And you did that. Maybe you forgot about it. God didn't. It was still an outcome. And everything in not only your life, remember the analogy I made to the shower, everything in your life led to that moment. And it wasn't just your life. It was your parents and your parents' parents and everybody in your periphery and everybody in their periphery. So the whole population of the earth up to the time you believed in Christ was involved in that moment. You get that, right? When you breathe, you're able to breathe because the blood of your ancestors is running through your veins. So all the people prior to you who are part of your DNA are part of your breathing right now. You're not your own. You didn't produce yourself. You had some say in the matter and you still do. You always have volition. But you're not totally your own. You're just part of a total. When you take a shower, somebody else had to make the pipes, somebody else had to make the shower head, somebody else had to make sure that the water gets up through the shower head and out onto your body, which you also didn't make. You have some say over it, over its health, over its, you know, ability to move. But you didn't produce your body, you didn't produce the shower head, you didn't produce the water, you didn't produce the pipes. You're paying for the rental or the, you know, you bought your house. You might have even installed the shower head and you might have even installed the plumbing. Okay, but somebody else made the pipes and somebody else made the shower head. You didn't make it. So everything you do is a product of somebody else. So every moment you live is a product of many somebody else's, all of which are enabled by God. So every moment is an outcome of all the prior moments. You got that. So it's not just the moment practicing righteousness fulfillment that's occurring in that moment. It's all the prior moments being summed up in that moment. Every moment that exists is a sum total of all the prior moments. And God's orchestrating the whole thing because he has to see it from start to finish. And so when he sees that moment, unlike us, he sees all of what it took for that moment to occur that way. Good, bad, or indifferent. That's an outcome. The meaning of the moment, therefore, is not its own making. The meaning of the moment, therefore, is not solely what you and I see in that moment. It's a product of everything that went before. And I mean everything. 
If truth is going to be free and truth is going to be full spectrum, there's no shaving. And it's all united. So part of the moment that you're experiencing right now includes Mohammed, Hitler, Mussolini, Genghis Khan. I'm trying to name bad people. People, you know, humans consider bad. The moment you're living right now is a product of those people too. Now why am I bringing this up? I'm trying to keep on showing how the practicing of righteousness is the end game. You know, grand strategy, as anybody will tell you in military science, grand strategy means that when you go to war, you have an ultimate purpose, an ultimate objective you're trying to achieve, and then you have to first properly define that. And if your grand strategy is wrong, it won't matter if all of your tactical strategies and other strategies are right. In other words, Hitler's grand strategy was to have the Thousand Year Reich. Because that grand strategy purpose was wrong, then everything and all the lives that got sacrificed and all the effort that got sacrificed to get it was also wrong. And of course it didn't work either, but that's beside the point. The strategy, the grand strategy was wrong. God's grand strategy is to practice righteousness. And in the last increment we saw how well every single moment is a victory and it can't be defeated at all, period. The only way to defeat the moment is to not practice righteousness. And even if you don't practice righteousness in moment A, you got moment B. So moment A it can be rescued by moment B because there's going to be a moment B. You can't die. So since every moment is the product of every other moment it's past, and since every moment is a moment to practice righteousness in itself is a victory in itself, then all those prior moments are rescued by every moment you practice righteousness, however small. And granted, I'm sure a bunch of the prior moments that led up to the one that you're in, there were a bunch of prior moments that had practicing righteousness in them also. But the moment you're in is a moment to practice righteousness right now. And it can rescue all those prior moments because it's the sum of all those prior moments. And if you fail, as you will, I do every day, there are, you know, if I were to say, how many moments am I practicing righteousness in a 24-hour day versus the whole day? Well, every time I use 1 John 1 9, I'm practicing righteousness. That just rescued all the prior moments prior to the time I used 1 John 1 9. And of course, all the time between sins, I'm practicing righteousness also. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just breathing. Okay, but I'm between sins and the Holy Spirit is controlling my soul. Not controlling like micromanaging, but controlling in the sense of guiding, showing, building me. That's practicing righteousness. So all the prior moments of not only my life, but all those lives that went into making my life are being rescued. Same thing's true for you. You're probably using 1 John 1 9 by now if you're listening to my audios. Because people, people don't like the fact that I talk about 1 John 1 9 so much. And they certainly don't like long audios. Yeah, because they have no attention span. You need 1 John 1 9 to get an attention span. So you're using it. So you've been practicing righteousness a lot. So you've been rescuing, you didn't know this, you've been rescuing all the prior moments that led up to the moment you're living right now. Every time you use 1 John 1 9, and that's just a start. That's the floor. You're between sins. So God's rescuing time. Not just buying time for the future, which I've harped on a lot. 
but rescuing the past that you weren't a part of because you weren't alive. I mean, your genes and my genes, we are the product of the past. Okay, what is the past? It's mostly a horrible past, a cruel past. People killing each other, people hating each other, people going at each other and, and arguing with each other and killing each other and raping each other and all kinds of, you know, horrible things that people do in their heads and with their bodies. All that petty living that went on for centuries and is going on right now. Your genes reflect all that. Somewhere in your past and mine is a rapist. Your genes have the genes of a rapist in them. A murderer. A thief. And pick anybody you want to call evil. Because all of our genes have somebody in that have somebody like that in our past. And all that is being made good on because hi, this gene of this rapist in the past is now in this body that's between sins. And the Holy Spirit's working on it. So you see, that justifies the existence of that rapist in the past who only survives as a gene in your body. But your body wouldn't be here if it weren't for that rapist in the past. You get the point? And your soul is acting on that body by being between sins. So wasn't it okay? I'm sure God did other things too, but just leaving this one thing. Isn't it okay that that rapist existed in the past so that your body could come out of your mother's womb and God imputed then a soul to it and therefore justified the existence of that rapist in the past and all the bad things that rapist did so that you could be alive now between sins? Yeah, that's an outcome. That's a victory too. See, the victory isn't simply the moments that you're living for its own innate pleasure and taste of practicing righteousness. Each moment is an outcome of all the past moments and all the past people who lived or are alive now. They're a part of the moment that you're in. You walk into your kitchen, you got a bunch of, maybe you have a, I don't know, part of your kitchen counter's got a bunch of spices on it. Mine does. And I'm looking right now, I'm standing in the kitchen to be exact, and I'm looking at my pepper and my Louisiana hot sauce and my Cajun, raging Cajun seasonings. And you know, thousands of people were required to make these bottles of spices, or the garlic, or the oregano, or the basil that I'm looking at right now. It took thousands of people to make those things that I got on my kitchen counter. They're all part of it too. I'm between sins. Just use 1 John 1 9 in case. So they're all part of that too. The past is being rescued, not just the future. I've harped and harped and harped on how the future, we're buying time for all these clueless Christians that are down here with us, and of course the unbeliever too, so we can get the gospel. That's how God uses us. My pastor spent 50 years teaching this. He called it Invisible Heroes in the Ephesians series. It changed his spiritual life. That's what he said, anyway. And I believe it, because I watched how it changed him. We're invisible heroes for the future to buy time right now, but it's also rescuing the past. Why did Christ come when he came? When he paid for sins, that rescued the past and bought the future. But it rescued the past, too. We are part of Christ. So what do you think our role is? We're rescuing the past, too. Every moment you're between sins, there is a rescue that just happened because you're between sins. Solely because of that, no matter what else you're doing. Because when you're between sins, the Holy Spirit's building your soul. And that pleases Father. And that makes it worthwhile, saves the past in terms of activities. 
See, Christ paid for sins, but there's an, there are other saves that have to occur. Making the past worthwhile. When you buy a computer, you have to go through a whole lot of trouble to figure out what to buy. What makes good on all that effort and time spent trying to figure out what to buy? The fact that you get a good deal. I mean, I spent, like I said before, eight months trying to fight, figure out what kind of computers to buy. It was a real nightmare for me because I wasn't, you know, paying much attention to computers and jargon and all that stuff. But you know what? It was worth it because I got computers I really wanted. I'm really happy and I don't feel sorry for the fact that I spent so much time and effort. The actual money cost was not very much. It was the time and effort that was horrendous. But it was worth it. That's how God feels about these moments where we're between sins. The Holy Spirit is building this soul inside a body that is a product of how many other bodies, all the bodies in the past, and everything that they did. So that this moment can occur, that the Holy Spirit is building this soul that's going to live forever, and that moment of him building this soul is also on, you know, on stage in front of God's face forever, and he loves it. Because why? Because he's practicing righteousness. And you agreed to it. Did you, are you meritorious because you agreed to it? No, you were smart. Who wouldn't agree to something that benefits the self? Our problem is that we don't understand what benefit means. I used one job on nine a few minutes ago. That was to my benefit. I'm not a good person because I did that. I'm a good person because what he's doing with it. And that's justifying all the genes of all the people that are sort of, as it were, in me. So now all those people are presuming, I, you know, it's probably only 1% of them are actually saved. They're dead. They're up in heaven, the saved ones. And they're saying, oh, look what God did to brain out. Oh, see, I'm part of brain out because my DNA is in brain out. Don't you think that they're happy? Don't you think that they're kind of like, oh, wow, this is a big moment for them. Apparently, I'm descended from a lot of Calvinists, which is ironic. At least half of me is. And I'm saying Calvinists, even though, you know, Calvinism is not something that's DNA. But the people who believed in Calvinism had bodies with DNA, and their bodies are part of what makes me, me. Don't you think they're happy? They're happy, number one, because they know how evil Calvinism is now. And they're glad to know that somebody's finally fessing up to it. And they're glad that they got to be part of the DNA in my body because I'm the one that, I don't know why God did this. God just flat, I'm not the only one, but still, I'm one of them. God chose to explain what's wrong with Calvinism. Using a person whose DNA is made up of former Calvinists. Because there are no Calvinists in heaven, honey. Once you die, you know very well that that's not it. Same thing for Catholicism or any other denomination you want to name. There are no denominations in heaven. We all, you, know, you get all that stupidity taken out of you when you die. They're happy. So every moment that I'm between sins is a victory for them in the past. Not just for me. Not just for the people down here. Not just for the people yet to be born. So see, it's an outcome. Every moment that you are between sins, and I'm not even talking yet about actually using Bible. I mean, 1 John 1 9 is a type of use of Bible, but it's a floor. It's an entry. That's a victory for all of your ancestors 
and everybody associated with you, whether they know it or not, and they will know. There's this verse that my pastor kept covering about pillars. That in the eternal state, there are all these buildings. Because, you know, how do you want to call it? The human race likes certain kinds of things. So God kits out heaven in light of what humans like. Their buildings, their ceremonies. Religion has a a bunch of ritual attached to it because humans like all that. The parades. There's food. But you have to apparently be a member of the elite to eat. I'm not really sure about that. My pastor talked about it that way. Humans like certain structures and societal things. So God kits out heaven that way. And one of the things he kits out, because humans like buildings, are buildings. And the pillars are, in the ancient world, um, what you did is you carved onto stone so it would last the exploits of a particular king what did he accomplish in his reign what was good about that king and include and in the more honest societies of which there were few what was bad about that king and it's it was carved in stone so it would last well that's what is depicted about believers who are made kings is that their so-called exploits are in stone. I, that makes me nervous and upset. But hey, it's God's rule, so it's God's rule. In other words, if I make it, or if you make it, and either or both of us are crowned kings in eternity, there's going to be a pillar that just puts down our lives on that pillar. Well, one of the things, or how does that pillar look, We know already because we got the Old Testament and the New Testament telling us what it looks like. We got the Book of Kings, for example. Chronicles. Story of Abraham. Story of Isaac. Story of Jacob. What did God record for us to know about them? Well, there's a sort of report going to be carved in stone about the kings among us. And if you and or I are in that list, there's going to be a pillar with your name on it, or my name on it, or both, that says, what? I don't know your story. You'll have to, you know, write out your own story. And this is going to hurt to even talk about my own, but I'm going to try. Brain out used 1 John 1 9. Brain out believed. Brain out kept believing. Brain out was kind of an ass, too. Of course, the particulars of how I was an ass are probably going to be there. And they're really bad. (laughs) I've been an ass in ways that most Christians wouldn't even know how to be an ass. In my head. And that's worse. But Brain Out kept believing in him. And here's what he did to Brain Out. Point, 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 bullet point, bullet point. And the world got rescued and got bought time because of what God did to Brain Out. And I'll be real specific about what that was. I, I can't bring myself to say those things. Some of it involves this Hebrew meter thing. That's going to be public. Forever. People are going to visit these pillars. And if I really am a king, I'm front page news every single day of the rest of my life for my kingdom because they need it that way. And I've talked about that before, that's the future. But what I didn't talk about and I'm talking about now is the past. The victory of the moment for itself, even if there was no other victory, and even if you fail in that moment, is that you tried to practice righteousness. That was the theme of the last increment. It's like an aorist tense. Aorist tense is a moment of time divorced from time. 
just that moment itself, irrespective of its results or what brought that moment to come to pass. All by itself, intrinsic to itself, that moment. You're practicing righteousness. That's a victory of itself. That's why it doesn't matter if Satan wins. Okay, but that's not the whole story. That moment itself is a product of all the prior moments. You get that now. That moment itself is therefore the progenitor of all the future moments. And one of those future moments is the moment that your name is on a pillar with all the things that God did to you on it and this is why you're a king. Because you're being turned into a progenitor even as you have progenitors, the chief of whom is Christ. That's um, Archegos. He just threw that at me. Uh, Hebrews 12 too. Archegos is usually translated leader or... Um, I'm not sure how they translate it, but it's the idea author. I think they use the word author. But it's progenitor. You are the product of Christ's thinking. Every time you learn and live on Bible. You're being sired by God. That's 1 John. It's usually translated born of God. But it means sired by. And specifically the Holy Spirit. You can't be sinning while you're being sired by God. Is what he's saying. No one born of God's No one born of God sins. You practice righteousness. When you're being sired by God, it means that you're between sins. You're in the Holy Spirit. You've used 1 John 1, 9. You haven't sinned again yet. And that's a victory that is an outcome of all the prior moments of history that brought about your own existence. So all those prior moments of history share in your victory in that moment of time or moments of time or minutes or hours between sins. And the people who are your progenitors biologically, who are in heaven, are going to know this. Even if you don't make kingship, you got a victory moment now that is the product of all those prior moments then. And everybody in the past, good, bad, or indifferent, who happens to be in heaven is sharing in that victory now. And the ones who are in hell, honey, they didn't want to share in it. But they still do, it's from God's perspective. God's making good on the ones in hell too. You see why hell has to exist forever? The people in hell, the people who don't believe, the people who are evil are just as much a part of your own existence now as the good ones. They're being made good on in you. Because the Holy Spirit's building you. Now, none of this that I've been saying, not a thing about it, is evident to the body on the outside. On the outside, like right now, this world is completely dead to everything I'm saying. Because it's not... It's not aware... It has an existence of its own. Truth be free. My countertop does not know that it's sharing in the victory of brain out. Because the victory is happening as I speak. Because I'm between sins. The countertop. My kitchen countertop is sharing in that victory right now. It doesn't know that. It's just a countertop. It's dead. To the whole idea. Okay, but God's not dead. God's seen that countertop. God's seen me walk through my apartment while I talk. Because I think better when I'm walking. You're listening. I'm listening. I'm talking. I have no idea what I'm going to say next. But there's a victory going on right this second while I talk. My countertop's part of it. My car is part of it. Everything I own is part of it. All my relatives are part of it. The ones that are dead are part of it. The ones that are alive are part of it. The whole world is part of it. Both today and in the past because I'm part of them 
And the Holy Spirit's working on me. We're all interconnected. They're not aware, or they wouldn't even want to know, or hear, or see. And I wouldn't want them to either. Brain out. They would think that what I'm saying in these audios is nuts. And you can understand why they think so. Because they're looking out at the world for evidence of God. They're looking out at the world for evidence of all these things being said. And you can't tell it from outside. It's God making it real to you inside your soul as you hear it. So he's working on your soul. That's your evidence. That's the only evidence. I still got my pile of mail. I've still got all the work I've got to do. I've still got all the computer maintenance. It's none of that is aware. But my soul is, and my soul's working on that, so it shares in it whether it knows or not. Same thing for you. So the, the victory is not merely the moment divorced from time, which is enough justification for that moment to even to want that moment at all, even if there were no victory before or after or no outcome. But there is an outcome because every moment is itself an outcome of all the past moments. And of course, is the progenitor of all future moments. Uh, he threw just he just threw something into my mind. Um, my pastor kept on saying, the idea of making a decision is to preserve the option to make greater decisions in the future. That's not exactly how he worded it, but that's what he's talking about. The freedom is you make a decision that produces freedom so that your options to make greater decisions in the future occurs. Every time you practice righteousness, that's what you're doing. You're making good on the past. And you're setting up a better future for everybody. But it will never, ever, 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 ever be evident. It's a declaration God makes because that's how he practices righteousness on the moment. This is the way he baptizes the moment. I'm between sins. He's building my soul. God's decreeing a whole bunch of other stuff to save the past, to save the future, to make the future more free, to make the past productive of freedom. It's total victory all around. It's like knitting together the veil in the temple. I don't know how much you are aware of the construction of that veil. And there's some speculation that maybe what we're told isn't 100% true, but supposedly the temple veil, and you can check this with someone else to see if I'm citing it incorrectly, but I believe that the reports are that the, the temple veil was something like six feet thick. It was woven of, of threads, blue, purple, red, and I want to say gold. It was woven six feet thick material. I, mean, I can't even fathom how you do that. The loom would have to be, you know, eight feet or nine feet thick. I don't even know how you weave material that thick. And it was 90 feet high. I think that comes from Josephus, but I think also the stories in the Bible. It's also in the Talmud somewhere. 90 feet tall, six feet thick. Well, each life is like a thread. And to thread it so that every thread connects some way to every other thread. That's what God's doing with history. Your life is a bunch of threads that's very thick. And every moment of your life is being threaded to the future by God in ways you can't detect. The world cannot detect what I'm saying. The only way you know it is through Bible and through God. But it's the meaning he baptizes onto everything. Knitting everything together. 
for good. That's he just threw that at my mind. Um, Romans eight twenty eight. This is what Romans eight twenty eight is. Now, when you live out this life, it's total blank to your body, total blank to your external existence. This is called living on faith. This is really what it is. You know this is God. You know this is how he thinks. You know this is what he's doing. But honey, you can't see it. You're living literally on faith. And faith means doctrine. Faith means Bible doctrine. When it says you live by faith, you live on faith, the word faith means the object believed, which is the doctrine, the contract, literally. The Greek word pistas means a belief in a content of a contract. It's a commercial term, not a religious term. The one who made the contract is pistis, usually translated faithful. That's God. Then the contract is the object of what this pistis, this faithful person, writes, and it, he deposits it in the temple, meaning that the contract is so valid that the wrath of the gods will come against the person who deposited the contract if he doesn't live up to it. The temple, of course, is Christ. God deposits his word in Christ. And therefore, God is committing himself to observing the contract. Now, you are become aware of this contract, and you're the beneficiary of this contract, so you are pistos, faith. You have faith in the object, the contract. So when you see the word faith in English Bibles, this is what it really means. You have faith in something else, you believe the something else, and the merit is in the something else. That's why you have the faith. In the ancient Greek times, when somebody deposited a contract in the temple of the gods, the person who was the beneficiary of the contract was notified of that, and the person who was the beneficiary of the contract believed in the gods, and therefore believed in the contract that the person who deposited the contract, the pistis, would do, would abide by the contract, because the gods would come after him if he didn't. So where's the merit? Not in the person who's believing in the contract, but in the contract, in the person who deposited the contract. That's where the obligation lies, and that's where the merit lies. Okay, well, the person who deposited the word in Christ is God, and he's the one with the merit, so you're believing in his merit. Got that? So by faith you live. By the content of the contract you live. Believing that God will make good on it, Romans 8.28. Not because of everything else around you. That you can't, that can't detect this faithfulness of God. That doesn't show that God's faithful. Heck, you can't even detect that God exists. Except through math. And except through looking up at the stars at the sky. Otherwise, all this stuff seems completely dead and unrelated to God, which of course it is because it's free. So you are living by faith. And that's the next victory. Remember, I've been saying all along how you're the product of the past. So your victory in a moment where you are between sins is saving the past, justifying its existence. Okay, but you're not just between sins. You're trying to learn and live on Bible and probably failing, but you're getting some of it right. You can't be 100% wrong either. We sinners are so bad at being sinners, we can't be 100% wrong either. you got to eat or pee, and it's not a sin to eat or pee. Guess what? You're not sinning 100% of the time either. So when you're between sins, you're not simply just standing there blank-minded between sins. No, if you're between sins, the Holy Spirit's building your soul. Therefore, some kind of Bible ideas or verses are hitting you. And you're interacting with them. So that's how come your soul is being built. And that's how your soul is being built. And that's God making good on everything. 
Romans 8, 28. So now there's more going on. You're writing an email between sins. You're doing the dishes between sins. You're driving your car between sins. You're waiting at the bus stop between sins. You're taking a shower between sins. You're cleaning out your closet between sins. And Bible ideas are hitting your head while you do that. So that's part of the, you know, what do you want to call it, the mechanism of what God's using. He's using the activity to build you, but the actual building that's going on isn't necessarily related to what you're doing at all. It's related to the principles that are hitting your head. And you can't see that either, and you can't even control it, and you don't know what's going on, but it's going on. Okay, well, that's an additional justification and benefit and payment, a dividend of the cross that's happening to you to further make good on all this stuff in the past and be progenitor to all this stuff in the future. Line on line, precept on precept. Not just while you're in Bible class. The Bible class is the seed. The root, the shoot, the eventual branching, the tree is being grown by the Holy Spirit in you. Not just to make good on the past or for the moment, but for the future. Because after all, he's making you into a king. And you're going to be nourishing your kingdom forever. And you have no idea that all this is going on. It's not detectable. You're living on the contract to know it. You're living on the Bible verse like Romans 8.28. My pastor called faith rest. You're believing in a promise of God. That's faith. It's faith in faith. Faith, you're believing. Faith, the contract. First meaning of the Greek word pistis. I'm sorry, pistos meant faithful. Pistis means the faith that you believe in. I had them backwards in my earlier explanation. You're believing in the contract. The contract itself is a statement of faith. The doctrine. And it's being built in you. So that you too are becoming pistos, faithful, by God's decree and by God's creation and by God's insurance. So those moments when you're practicing righteousness are the sum total and the justification for the prior moments of your own and everybody else and are laying the foundation for a future that God himself is threading together in this big thick veil. In order to make good on everything. And it's completely undetectable, even as it is completely invincible. You can't see God physically, but you do see him, and you know you see him by now, I'm sure. Okay, well, this is what else is going on that you also can't see with your physical eyes. And will not be detectable to your body because the body's dead to God. That's Romans 8, 1 through 10. But you can see scripture and you can see him. So you know this is true because you know what? God's seeing it with his eyes. And he's doing it for his son. So you know this is true. So you see, you do have, by practicing righteousness, not only the moment's satisfaction, but the knowledge that all prior moments are being made good on and the knowledge that the future is being bought. That the current moment is a progenitor to the future as well as justification of the past. And yet, all you're doing is writing an email or washing the dishes or cleaning your closet. So, that's the bifurcated victory. I mean, knowing Bible will help you do a better email, wash the dishes better, clean your closet better. And all the other things you do with the body. It'll make them more competent. I've already talked about competency issue. At the same time, 
in the universe you can't see. The universe of the past and the universe of the future. God is taking what you're learning and justifying the past and providing the foundation for the future, your own and everybody else's. Because he flat ordained it to work this way, because that's Romans 8.28. And that too, even if Satan won, is unassailable. Because even if Satan won, Satan only has, would, if Satan won, an hour from now. The only thing he can change is the future. And don't you think God would know if Satan won? And in fact, God does know, and he tells us Satan isn't going to win. But so what if he did? Christ already paid for sins, honey. Can't take that away. Satan can't undo the past. Because if he undoes the past, then he undoes his own past. So he's not going to do that. The only thing Satan could change if he beat God was take over the future. Okay, but the past is already made good on. So what do you think the future is going to be? And since God is still practicing righteousness, honey, there's no defeat against the future either. Even if Satan won, which he's not going to do, but even if he did, so what? So you see, your life is exactly like Christ because Christ on the cross made good on the past, which is why you're here to be able to be you. And every moment you're between sins, you're not simply between sins. You're learning Bible. And that's adding dividends. You're a dividend of the cross. And more is being added to you. And therefore more justification against the past that went wrong is being made. And more justification and foundation for the future is being laid. And you're a progenitor of it. And someday... Maybe a hundred years from now, assuming the universe lasts that long. Somebody's going to be a product of you. And if you end up being a king, a whole bunch of people are going to be a product of you. And that's the ultimate about outcome. You know, the last thing we just talked about the moment. Now we're talking outcome. You are an outcome yourself. And somebody's going to be, not just one somebody whole bunch of people are going to be an outcome of you. Even while you're just on the surface writing an email, trying to do it better, using Bible to do it, or cleaning your toilet, in order to use Bible better, that's your motive for cleaning the toilet. It's not about cleaning the toilet. It's not about what you eat for breakfast. It's not about the email you're writing. It's about what God is doing to you while you do it. And what that moment means has an effect all the way back to the past to justify it more and more Romans 8 28 and all the way future forever and the biggest thing at least for me the biggest motive I have in wanting to go through this is God sees it now it pleases him now but it isn't simply about his pleasure because he wants it to do all these other jobs too. And you know what? He sees it. So I believe him. I can't see it. That's Hebrews 2. We don't see it happening now. He sated. Well, you know, Psalm 110 is taking place. Operation Footstool. We don't see it now. But it's happening. So we live by faith, not by sight. And this is what you're believing. This is what's happening. All the past, all the future, all justified in the one moment you're living between sins, every moment you pick. That's the satisfaction. So you're just like Christ, Isaiah 53, 11. He, re, he sees, he's by, he's satisfied. So you can be too.